so on we go. <coughs> okay, here's Earth and Moon, oxygen 16, 17 space. If we look at <coughs> the details of this line, so we're going to redefine ox delta oxygen 17 as the difference between the measured O17 and the O18 compared to this small number. Oh my goodness, Earth is actually different than the moon. A very tiny, tiny difference. So this is a difficult measurement to make, but it shows that there is a very, very small difference in the isotope ratio of the moon and the Earth, even though they look like they're on the same line. Okay, so this is, um, so Naomi Levin will be talking about what we can do if you begin to look at the details of this kind of stuff on a different scale. And again, this is, but now applied to biological and ecological systems. So until, again, 10 years ago, this sort of stuff was really done by pretty much only the meteorite people where they're looking at the really big differences. But we see now that on Earth, there's some really interesting subtle differences that we can look at. Okay, so if that's not bad enough, if we can just get rid of all of these gigantic meteorites, then we can start to get our atmosphere going. Well, what happens is, uh, well, what's giving the atmosphere? It's volcanoes. If we actually look at volcanoes, volcanoes have this chemical reaction. We call it the QFM buffer, quartz, phaolite, quartz, phaolite, magnetite. So this is all reduced iron. This is partly reduced, partly oxidized iron. So this is an oxidation of this volcanic mineral. Silica, magnetite, forsterite, oxygen, okay? <clears throat> At 1400 degrees Celsius, the oxygen concentration of the atmosphere is buffered at about 10 to the minus 15. Okay, what's the atmosphere today on Earth? Oxygen? How much oxygen is our atmosphere? 21%. 21 so that's a little more than 10 to the minus 1. So 10 to the minus 14, 10 to the minus 15 is 14 orders of magnitude lower. That's the stuff coming out of volcanoes. That's what our atmosphere should be if it's buffered by Earth at 1400 degrees. If we cool it down to the surface temperature of the Earth, the actu that actually consumes oxygen. And this is what QFM should be at 25 degrees Celsius. Turns out 10 to the minus 45 is one molecule of oxygen in our entire atmosphere. <laughs> okay, one. So that's what our atmosphere should be it's just kind of not quite enough for, you know, you guys. Okay? Plants don't care, though. Okay? So we should have essentially an oxygen-free atmosphere. Now, a couple of other things in geological history that are going on. We're outgassing things. Uh, this is a, a paper done by Dick Holland in the absence of isotopes, kind of uh, trying to figure out, well, where could we possibly, what could the history of our planet be with supply of hydrogen, the demand of hydrogen using various kinds of weathering uh, products. It's kind of a hard thing to figure out. And then about, again, about 10 or, well, maybe 15 years ago, <coughs> uh, a group at um, uh, uh, UC San Diego, Mark Tiemens and Jim Farquhar, uh, started looking at a survey of sulfur isotopes, this delta that I introduced to you just before, but delta 33 sulfur isotopes. <coughs> and they found a really curious thing. If you try to look at marine, sulf marine sulfur deposits, over the last 4 billion years, we find for the last 2.4 billion years, it's essentially zero. And before that, we have these huge fluctuations. What went different? Their interpretation is that this is when we had ozone in the atmosphere. So ozone from here to here, no ozone before about 2.4 billion years ago. Okay, 
to get ozone in the atmosphere, you have to have enough oxygen to actually have oxygen combined to two oxygen molecules together. It has to be enough to get two oxygens together in the presence of uh, photocatalytic reactions. <clears throat> so we think there's, so this has got to be all low oxygen atmosphere, and this is at least higher, but we don't know what those values are, and we'll get to that shortly. Uh, and for geologists, this is a really interesting observation because this is a fundamental change in a certain kind of minerals and ore deposits that we find on planet Earth. And these, for years, oops, come back to that a second. This is the delta that I just talked about. So here's sulfur 33, sulfur 34. We're just interested in this distance. This is the delta 33 sulfur just like we showed with the oxygen, okay? And this is the topic that Naomi Levin will be talking about, this little, you know, new space that we can explore in isotope uh, biogeochemistry, okay? So this is the Hammersley Range in Australia, and we have these weird things called banded iron formations, and they formed on planet Earth only from about 1.9 to 2.5 billion years ago. Okay, so all the iron that you guys use, anybody here ever use iron for anything? Okay, all of that iron is mined from a kind of deposit that formed in a very short period of Earth history. We don't, our planet doesn't make banded iron formations anymore. Okay, <clears throat> so again, if iron is a very important component of some planet as iron deposits, um, how is it gonna be made? Well, these banded iron formations uh, our planet had been around for three billion years before there was sufficient oxygen in our atmosphere and oceans to make banded iron formations, okay? So, um, and it's, it's actually uh, sort of interesting thinking about the history of Earth. Different minerals have showed up at different times because of the gradual oxidation of our planet. Well, this is kind of what we think in the long scale history of things. Here's atmospheric oxygen. This is what it looked like at the beginning. We think, and the, uh, Kate Freeman will be talking about evidence for photosynthesis before three billion years ago and of life before three billion years ago based on biological molecules uh, that, that, that are believed to be only possible to synthesize using biology. And here we are at 1.5 billion years ago. So we've gone three billion years and oxygen is still indistinguishable from zero on this scale. Things that we call plants, perhaps by a billion years ago. Things that we call animals, half a billion years ago. Okay? <clears throat> so again, on this scale, only now we got a log scale. This is kind of where we think we are. So today we're at 20% oxygen. Animals are really energy hogs, okay? Uh, especially compared to plants. Plants are the thing that make the nasty old oxygen that's a waste product for them, but very important to us. So animals have only been on the planet for the last 10%, and it's because there was not enough oxygen in our atmosphere uh, until, um, until half a billion years ago. So we went four billion years where life was not, definitely not habitable, not only to us, to any other animals. So it took a long time, a lot of prep time uh, to get ready for you guys. Okay, so a quick summary um, um, reproduced from a wonderful book by Don Canfield, published a book a couple years ago called Oxygen, Four Billion Year History, very readable uh, book. Um, and uh, so here's kind of his notion of the log concentration of oxygen on Earth, a prebiotic atmosphere somewhere between 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 25, who knows. <clears throat> so the first couple of billion years here, we, have, we do get life. We, the free oxygen that's produced by, by, uh, by aerobic organisms is absorbed by the oxygen, by the oceans and marine sediments, okay? We don't be begin to oxidize uh, the, the, the land until 
about two billion years ago. So now we're beginning to oxidize the land surface and we can begin to accumulate oxygen in the atmosphere. Okay, so here we might get up to 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus one bars of, uh, of, of, of oxygen. Okay, here oxygen is high enough for animal life. Okay, so this is just a log modern oxygen, which this, remember, modern oxygen is a little more than 10 to the minus one. Okay, so this is extremely low oxygen uh, fugacities. Okay, so um, what is a habitable planet? We're, you know, constantly reading in the newspapers about, oh, we discovered another planet, maybe it's a habitable planet, um, and it might be in terms of temperature and distance from the sun and all that, but if there's not the time component, forget it. It's got to be around for a very long time to be uh, habitable and for life uh, to develop. So these short-lived star system of a few million years, absolutely forget it. That's a nasty time for life to develop. Okay? So in summary, that's, that's the summary of, uh, of oxygen on Earth and thinking in terms of planet habitability. Uh, here's our age of the Earth. Early atmosphere, extremely low oxygen. Takes a long time to get to where we are. Uh, and again, your lifetime that you've experienced is just, you know, about that long on the on the, the, the trail from Miami to Seattle and is not a particularly representative period of time and there probably is no representative. There is no 25 years or thousand or even million years that's really representative of the history of our planet. So I'm going to just take like a one minute break before I jump into the next topic which will be kind of some common rules and definitions. <laughs>